Five Nights at Freddy's. Fazbear Frights. Number eight. Story one. Gumdrop Angel. Angel opened her eyes and saw nothing. Darkness. Had she gone blind? She tried to blink, but found she couldn't. Was she even worse off now than before? She felt weak and heavy. Her body ached. Angel raised her hands to try and rub her eyes, to clear the guck from them. But her hands whacked against something hard. Try not to panic, she groped around to figure out what she'd hit. All she felt was wood, flat, smooth, unrelenting wood surrounding her. She was in some kind of box, a very small box. Angel tried to scream, but her mouth wouldn't work properly. She began writhing her body, flailing her limbs. But it did no good. She just kept banging against the box. She was trapped, and she felt really strange, woozy, like she was going to pass out. Why was this happening to her? Angel really wished she had earplugs, and nose plugs, and blinders. No, skip all that. Angel really wished for the ability to teleport. Yeah, that would be good. If she could teleport, she could just instantly go someplace else. But first, she'd have to be invisible so she could get away with teleporting. Or maybe she could have superpowers so she could just obliterate everything that was here. No, that might be a little extreme. Teleporting would be good enough. Where would she go? Pretty much anywhere but here. A land full of sewer, the most dangerous part of town. She could think of a million horrible places that would be an improvement on our current situation. After all, what could possibly be worse than here? Angel and her family were in Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. And if there was a place on Earth that was more like hell than this, Angel didn't know about it. Freddy's was bad enough on its own. A relentlessly bright and cherry place with decor in strictly primary colors, and a headache-inducing black-and-white checkerboard floor. But then you added the children. No, not just the children. Amped-up children, crazed over excited, peering in the ball pit, puking in the arcade children. Not much was worse than a few dozen little kids having a birthday party. It was obnoxious mixed with miserable topped with shoot me now. Angel looked around, and she had to admit that some of her distaste, all right, maybe all of it, could have been related to envy and resentment. Her birthday had been the month before, and no one had thrown her a party of any kind. Maybe at some point in Angel's life, she could have appreciated a kid's birthday party. Theoretically, she would have liked having her own birthday party here when she was little. She was sure if she did a party, she wouldn't have been as loud and unsufferable about it as the kids in Freddy's were. She would have been happy, yes, but she would have been graceful about it. At least, she liked to think so. But then again, she never got to test that theory. Seeing as her dad, not a current pathetic excuse for a stepdad, but a biological father, equally pathetic apparently, left when she wasn't even walking yet. Her mother had to be both the moneymaker and the full-time parent. During those years, her mom had disappeared into a job, while somehow staying in a constant state of broke. There was just never enough money for things like birthday parties. Now that Angel's mom had married Myron, a.k.a. Call Me Dad, no, thank you very much. Parties like this were in the budget. But, well, Angel was older and so over ostentatious displays of birthday frivolity. And come on, was a little kid's birthday honestly important enough to spend thousands of dollars on balloons, pizza, soda, cake, candy, and presents? No way. It was a waste of resources. That money could have bought Angel a car or paid tuition for the performing arts college she wanted to attend. 
Thankfully, Angel had qualified for a student loan based on her mom's low income in this last year before she married Myron. But Angel shouldn't have had to get financial help, not when Myron could more than afford to pay her way. She never did call him dad, but that was because he hadn't earned it. Wasn't a dad supposed to pay for his kid's education? Angel looked at the woman who had gotten her into this screwed up situation. Her mother. Her weak, self-interested, gold-digging mother. If only her mother paid half as much attention to her daughter as she did to her own looks. Still reasonably young, Angel's mom had bouncy short blonde hair, bright blue eyes, and a face she spent thousands of dollars a year to keep pretty. Forget homework help or mother-daughter dates. Angel's mom was too busy spending half the day working out or updating her wardrobe at the mall. Maybe Angel's mom would have been halfway decent if she'd had a good partner by her side. But then again, maybe not. Angel's mom wasn't exactly a paragon of patience or understanding. She also wasn't very good at cooking, cleaning, organizing, or planning. She didn't have a cool job like film editor, or fashion designer, or talent agent. From observing her friends' mothers, Angel thought these were the qualities that went into being a great mom. The qualities her mother had, an expert at improving her own looks, a wizard at makeup and clothes shopping, a world-class champion of flirting with men, a connoisseur of slipping in, and a master of self-absorption to the point that she forgot anything not associated with her own happiness, did not make her a good mom material. Behind Angel, a little girl squealed, hitting decibels that should have been illegal. Angel put her fingers in her ears. Stop that! Angel's mother snapped. You're 18, not 8! All right. And that was her mother's other notable quality. Stara bowing to whatever man was paying the bills at the time. The truth was that Angel's mom didn't like loud, screaming children any more than Angel did. But right now, she was playing the role of Miriam's wife. And Miriam's wife was the mother of a five-year-old. This meant Angel's mom had to pretend she was happy to be at this party. And part of that pretense was to chastise Angel for dropping the act. Angel rolled her eyes. Her mother was pathetic. So was Myron. And so was Ophelia, Myron's revolting daughter. The whole family was pathetic. Even Angel was pathetic because she had to be part of this family. She needed to get out of it. She'd come so close to surviving her childhood without facing the stepdad thing. The whole time she'd been growing up, her mother had been looking for the right husband and father. The right husband and father being one who had lots and lots of money. Angel had lost count of the number of men who had come and gone over the years. There'd always been some guy. Some of them had kids, some of them didn't, but when Angel had been dragged along on family dates, she'd had the comfort of knowing it was temporary. She didn't have to go home with the guy or the kids, but then her mom had met Myron, and Ophelia came with Myron. Who named a kid Ophelia? Ophelia was Hamlet's lover, a woman who'd gone crazy because Hamlet had seemingly gone crazy. Did that seem like the best inspiration for Baby's name? Curious about Ophelia's name, Angel had looked up the meaning of it. Ophelia was a Greek name, she discovered, and it meant help, as in help. I was named after a tragic mental case. It had made her laugh when she'd read that. She could hear Ophelia's chirpy little kid voice saying it now. Speaking of the annoying squeaky voice, Don't you want some pizza? Ophelia asked Angel. Before Angel could answer, Ophelia said, I share mine. Then she pushed a slice of the foul smelling excuse for pizza toward Angel's face. Angel hated Freddy's pizza. The sauce had way too much basil, which gave it the offensive smell and made it, as far as Angel was concerned, inedible. Ophelia missed Angel's mouth and smeared Angel's jaw with sauce. She could feel her hair sticking to it, too. Angel slapped Ophelia's hand. Get that away from me! Ophelia's face crumpled. She jacked back, and the pizza slice flew out of her hands, 
landing face down on Angel's chest before sliding into a lap. Angel jumped up, and the pizza fell to the floor. She looked at the red stain on her good jeans. You little brat! She yelled at Ophelia. Ophelia's chin quivered. Tears spilled from her eyes. I was just trying to share. Don't yell at your sister! Angel's mother cut in. She's not my sister! Angel shouted. She grabbed for some paper napkins and wiped out her face and hair. As she did, she noticed several kids and adults at surrounding tables were staring at her. Great. She managed to make a spectacle of herself, even in a room full of maniac kids. She felt her face redden, and she sat down. Angel? Myron growled, throwing her a scathing look, which he reserved exclusively for her stepdaughter these days. He turned to Ophelia. Come here, my princess. Ophelia, crying hard now, crawled into Myron's lap. She hit me, Daddy. I was just trying to share my pizza. Ophelia raised her arm for Myron's inspection. There was nothing on her arm except pizza sauce, but Myron looked at the poor offended arm and kissed it. Then he turned on Angel. I didn't hit her, Angel said before he could say anything. I shoved her hand away, but it wasn't technically true, but Angel would get grounded for a year if she admitted to hitting Ophelia. Myron opened his mouth, but he was cut off by one of the animatronic performers on the stage in front of that table. Being the birthday girl, Ophelia had to have a prominent place in the audience for the Fazbear Extravaganza show. They were two feet from the stage. If Angel had wanted to, she could have reached out and swiped frosting of Ophelia's five-foot-tall layered cake. It was sitting on stage, to the side of where the animatronics were going to perform. Angel had been dreading the big show because she knew it would be loud and chaotic, over the top. Now, however, she was grateful for it. It was drawing attention away from the family drama playing out at that table. Ophelia immediately forgot the assault on her precious arm. She turned to Myron. Up, Daddy, up! He dutifully repositioned her on his lap so she could stand on his thighs. The fell skirt of Ophelia's yellow hoodie dress puffed up into Myron's face. He kept a grip on Ophelia with one hand and shoved aside the toll with his other. Ophelia stared up at the stage with bright eyes. She wiggled her hips and threw her arms around in an awkward dance of some kind. Angel hated Ophelia. The kid was a nuisance, always dragging out a board game or begging to play pretend with Angel. She would jump into bed with Angel almost every night with a book and a wine of, Will you read to me? Sometimes, Angel did read to Ophelia, but she resented the time it took. Angel was busy. She didn't have time for a little sister. And then there were the horses. Ophelia had a thing about horses. Her whole room was filled with them. Plush horses, plastic horses, wood horses, posters, photos and oil paintings of horses. She had a huge rocking horse in her room. And though she was getting too big for it, she rode it every day. So did her dolls. That was Ophelia's world. Horses and dolls. It was, in fact, the theme of today's party, too. Angel was so sick of horses, of hearing about them, reading stories about them, being forced to join Ophelia and playing with them. When Ophelia had demanded that her birthday party be at Freddy's, which was, sadly, her favorite restaurant, Angel had pointed out that a party at Freddy's wouldn't be a horse-themed party, which was also what Ophelia wanted. Freddy's didn't have horse characters, but Ophelia wasn't deterred. She wanted what she wanted. Usually, Freddy's parties were Freddy-themed, so Myron had to renegotiate with Freddy's manager to bring in special-themed napkins, plates, hats, and decorations. He also bought every kid in the place a horse toy. Angel had had enough pretend neighing today to last a lifetime. I love my party, Daddy! Ophelia cried out. She grinned, revealing pizza sauce, stained teeth, and looking for all the world like some kind of cannibal. It wasn't a pretty picture. 
Not that any picture with Ophelia in it could be pretty. No matter how you dressed her up, Ophelia was truly an ugly little girl. Poor kid. That was the only thing that made Angel feel an ounce of kindness toward her. No question Ophelia was a thorn in Angel's side, but the poor thing couldn't help how she looked. Just as Angel got her mom's looks, Ophelia got Myron's. For reasons Angel couldn't fathom, her mom thought Myron was a catch. Not just because of the money. She actually thought he was handsome. Angel thought Myron was a gorilla. Tall and trunk-shaped, Myron had dark brown hair all over his body. He was the hairiest man Angel had ever seen. Now, of course, Ophelia didn't inherit that trait from her daddy. But she did get his prominent brow ridge, large nose, and small eyes. She also got his long arms. She looked like a chimpanzee, which was sad. Chimpanzees were cute, but kids who looked like chimpanzees weren't. On the stage in front of Ophelia, Freddy's animatronics were getting ready to perform, and an announcer, a male Freddy's employee wearing a top hat and a bright red tuxedo, was chattering away with the crowd. The announcer was young and blonde, round-faced, and perpetually smiling. Is everyone having a super-duper time? The announcer asked. Yes! All the kids shouted. Ophelia screeched her yes even louder. The sound sent a stab of pain through Angel's temples. Is everyone ready to have even more fun? Freddy himself called out. Yes! The kids chorused. Fun! More fun! Ophelia squealed. She wiggled so spastically in her dad's lap, he almost dropped her. Are we ready to rock and roll? Freddy shouted. Everyone in the restaurant except Angel yelled, Yes! And then the restaurant was filled with cheers. Angel noticed Myron was giving his stepdaughter the evil eye around Ophelia's billowing yellow skirt. Angel didn't care. The restaurant was now far too loud for Myron to chew out Angel. Ignoring her stepdad, Angel left her family at the table and went in search of a restroom so she could try and salvage her jeans. The long rectangular tables in Freddy's were crammed together and they were all full of hyper little kids and a smattering of wary looking adults. Angel had to twist this way and that to work herself free of the unruly pack. When she was almost through the melee, Angel collided with one of Freddy's employees. As she started to say, excuse me, he turned toward her. She only got her first word out because she was looking at one of the cutest guys she'd ever seen, and he robbed her of the ability to speak. Sorry, the cute guy said. I should have been looking where I was going. Angel opened her mouth, and nothing came out. The cute employee grinned at her and started to say something else. But that's when the animatronics on stage started belting out a rock song with ear shriveling vocals. The singers combined with the band's heavy on the drums and electric guitar style made speaking impossible. Angel began to move on, but the cute employee took a hand and led her out of the dining area. She thought that was a little presumptuous, but she didn't protest because the hand was warm and strong. And it was attached to the cute employee. Also, he was pulling her away from the noise and this backstick mayhem both on the stage and in the audience. Aware of the pizza sauce still in her hair, Angel raised the hand to swipe at her face. She wished she had a mirror so she could clean herself up. If not for the pizza sauce, Angel would have been pretty confident about her appearance. Although her mom hadn't done much for Angel, she had passed on her good genes. Angel had her mother's blonde hair, only Angel's was shoulder length, blue eyes, pleasant features, and slender body. Even though she wasn't much for fashion and cosmetics like her mother was, Angel had her own style. She didn't wear a ton of makeup. She simply lined her eyes with coal and kept her lips glossed. She was into retro thrift store clothes, and she was a whiz with scarves and jewelry and other accessories. 
She liked playing with them so much, she usually kept an extra scarf or strand of beads in her pass so she could change her look when it suited her. Today, she'd done some cool loops with a 70s belt around her narrow waist, and under that, she wore a filmy 60s peasant top that clung to her just right. If Ophelia hadn't decided to spill sauce all over her, Angel would have been fit for a date right now. The cute guy led Angel down the hallway outside the dining room. The hallway lined with cartoony pictures of Freddy's animatronic characters ran along the length of the dining area, connecting Freddy's entrance with the back of the restaurant, which presumably was where the kitchen and offices were. The pictures were framed in bright yellow, and all the characters wore happy, jaunty expressions. A few doors opened up off the hallway, including those to the restrooms. Angel eyed the ladies' room door as they passed it. She wished she could go in and clean herself up. They were headed, though, toward the front door of the restaurant. Angel wondered if the cute employee was going to try and get her to leave with him. But he just took her to the little waiting area filled with red plastic chairs, which was near the entrance. When they reached the chairs, the cute employee motioned to them. Have a seat. I'll be right back. He darted back down the hall. They'd just come down. Angel wondered, even as her butt hit the mold of plastic, why she was so dutifully doing what the guy wanted. Had she inherited more from her mom than she thought she had? Was she turning into a male-pleasing automaton? Angel couldn't explain why, but she waited in the chair for at least a minute. Then, concerned that she was abdicating her entire sense of an independent self, Angel started to stand. Why had she let the guy drag her out here in the first place? The cute employee reappeared. He was carrying several paper towels and a spray bottle of what looked like water. He sat down on the seat next to hers. Wow, he was cute! Just a little taller than Angel, the guy was broad-shouldered, narrow-hipped, and clearly fit. With dark hair and dark eyes, and strong features, he had the kind of looks that pretty much any girl with eyes would find attractive. I'm Dominic, the cute guy said. He had a wonderful voice, deep and resonant. Angel involuntarily lowered herself back into the chair. Angel, she said. Yes, you are. Angel rolled her eyes. Dominic grinned. You've had that one before. Of course you have. Angel smiled. She couldn't help it. He was irresistible. But she made it sound better than anyone else has. Dominic laughed. <laughs> now that's a good line. I should take lessons from you. Angel laughed. <laughs> no, that's a terrible idea. I just sort of blurt out whatever I'm thinking. That's not always the best thing. I disagree. Honesty is highly underrated. A group of giggling little girls burst out of the dining room, ran down the hallway, and poured into the ladies' room like a swarm of furly pink-clad bees. Angel was glad now she wasn't in the ladies' room. She turned back to Dominic and figured she might as well see where this encounter went. Thank you for saving me. Did I? I was just doing my job. I'm an assistant manager here, and one of my duties is to make sure the customers are happy. I saw a pretty girl smeared with pizza sauce, and I figured she'd be happy if it was cleaned up. He raised the spray bottle and the paper towels. Dominic reached out and touched Angel's pizza sauce crusted hair. Not that you don't totally rock this Italian food in the hair look. Angel laughed. Dominic leaned toward her. Angel held her breath. Do you mind? Dominic said. I don't think pizza sauce is a good conditioner. And as a hair color, well, this particular shade of red doesn't match the rest of your hair. Angel said nothing. She was trying to remember what she last ate. She hadn't eaten any of the pizza her mom and Myron ordered. But she did have some chocolate candy. Well, that shouldn't have given her bad breath. Dominic was dabbing at her hair and the skin of her jaw and neck with paper towels he'd spread with whatever was in the plastic bottle. Whatever it was smelled flowery and it was warm. It felt soothing against the skin of her jaw and her ear, and he was being so gentle. 
Who was this guy? It seemed like he came from an entirely different planet than the guys at his school. They were oafs by comparison. None of the guys she knew at her school would know how to clean pizza sauce out of hair. Okay, that's better, Dominic said. He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Then he looked down at her jeans. He held out more wet towels. Think you can handle the rest? I don't want to be disrespectful. Angel laughed and took the towels. I appreciate that. She worked at the stain on her jeans. The deep red faded a little, but didn't disappear. She hoped it would come out in the wash. So, I assume you're here with your family, Dominic said, once Angel was cleaned up. Yeah, sort of. My stepsister is the birthday girl. Ah, so I did save you. Does she make you clean the fireplace and scrub the floor too, Cinderella? She would if she was old enough to care about that stuff. For now, her daddy, my stepdad, is the one on my case. Ah, yeah, that can suck. Yes, it can. I haven't seen you before. What school do you go to? I'm graduating from Marymount in a month. You? Same. Graduating in a month, but from Graves Academy. Ooh, snazzy. Graves Academy was a private school for Brainiacs. Angel was impressed in spite of herself. <laughs> yeah, right. Dominic gestured at his Freddy's vest and name tag. I know I make this Freddy thing look good, but you should see me in my school uniform. It would knock your socks off. Angel looked down at her sandal-clad feet. So did Dominic. See? Dominic said. Even thinking about me in my uniform knocked her socks off. Angel laughed even as she groaned. Dominic smiled. So, how did you end up wearing our pizza instead of eating it? Please tell me a server didn't get this sloppy. No, not a server. Ophelia. Dominic raised an eyebrow. Hamlet's hapless lover? Yeah, right. See, I was just thinking about that. Why would you name a child Ophelia? I guess it's a pretty name, but it has some heavy connotations. And Ophelia is... My stepsister. Ah, oh, the wicked stepsister. Out, out, damn spot. Angel laughed. I think you're suffering from Shakespearean confusion. Something wicked this way comes, Dominic said. Angel laughed harder. Better sentiment, but you're still in the wrong play. Ah, well. This above all, to thine own self be true. Ding, ding, ding. Give the man a prize, Angel said. He made his way back to Hamlet. They both laughed, and then they both spoke at once. Angel said, Thank you for... Just as Dominic said, Listen, how about... They both stopped and grinned. Before either could finish a sentence, a woman's voice called out, Dominic! Angel and Dominic turned toward the voice. Another Freddy's employee, a thirty-something woman, stood just outside the dining room. There you are, she said. The woman was tall and athletic-looking, with brown hair cut up in a ponytail. She wore a Freddy's uniform, and she looked perfectly calm in spite of the chaos swelling around her. Dominic stood. Hey, Nancy, I'm coming. Meet me in the kitchen, Nancy said. Dominic turned and held out his hand. Angel took it. She was happy to have the chance to hold her hand again. I'm sorry to abandon you all to this. He waved his arms out. And your evil stepsister too. But duty calls. No problem. He smiled at her. Before my boss so rudely interrupted, I was about to ask if you might like to go out tomorrow night. There's an indie band playing at the Rocket House. Would you be game? Sure, I'd like that. Great. If you give me your number, I can pick you up. If you don't want to give me your number, you can meet me there. Angel rattled off her home phone number. Dominic laughed. Okay, then. He repeated the number back to her, and she nodded. You won't forget it? She asked when he didn't write it down. She wanted to kick herself because she sounded like a nag. He didn't seem to mind. I have a great memory. I won't forget it. Or you. Angel blushed. Dominic reached into the pocket of the uniform vest. And here, here's my Freddy card. You can always call me. Angel took the card and stuck it in her jeans pocket. But you won't have to call me, Dominic said. I'll beat you to it. I am going to be working here late tonight. 
lots of cleanup to do, and then prep for another party tomorrow. I'll call you later this evening to set up the time, Dominic said. Angel nodded. Are you heading back in? Dominic asked her. She shrugged, then nodded. I guess I have to. Dominic laughed and offered his arm. Then may I escort you to the pandemonium, my lady? Angel laughed and took his arm. You may, Prince Charming. Dominic chuckled and led her back into the dining room. He squeezed her hand briefly before letting her go in the doorway. Until later, he said. She nodded. Where have you been? Myron demanded when Angel got back to her family's table. The band was getting ready for a sing-along. Angel glared at him. I had to go clean up the pizza sauce. Your clumsy daughter decided to smear all over me. Angel's mom leaned in. The snarky attitude isn't necessary. Ophelia is only five years old, Angel. Yeah, I know. And yet, she's the head of the household. How does that make sense? Myron shook his head. The sing-along started, and Angel noticed Dominic, who was now singing too, moving gracefully from table to table. His voice could be heard above the din of all the kids' voices. He had a really nice voice. As she watched him singing with a trio of rambunctious boys, Angel wondered if Dominic wanted to be a performer. That was what she was going to be. Angel was going to be an actress, singer, and dancer. She was equally talented at all three. Truly. All the teachers in the drama and music department at high school had told her she was talented enough to make it in the entertainment industry. All the teachers in the drama and music department at a high school had told her she was talented enough to make it in the entertainment industry. They were the ones who'd encouraged her to apply to the performing arts school. She probably wouldn't have had the confidence to do it without their urging. Audiences are going to eat you up, Angel. Her favorite drama teacher had said when she'd given Angel the application. You're going to be special, unlike any other. When she'd applied to school, Angel had no idea how she was going to pay for it because Myron said he wasn't paying for some art school that can't prepare you for the real world. She was thrilled that she qualified for loans. Angel watched Dominic dance a sort of modified rumba with a few little kids. Their faces shine with joy. It was strange. Earlier today, this same scene would have had Angel rolling her eyes. But watching how good Dominic was with the kids, it made her see this place in a whole different light. Her mother poked Angel's arm. Why aren't you singing? You love to sing. Angel shrugged. Her mom had a point. Why not sing? So she sang. Not so loud, her mother said immediately. Angel stopped singing and crossed her arms. She tried to return to Dominic watching, but a group of kids were now dancing on chairs, and they blocked her line of sight. Another eternity later, the singing stopped, and finally the announcer made a big production of bringing Ophelia up on the stage to blow out candles on the gargantuan cake. Of course, Ophelia couldn't even manage her five candles. The animatronics helped her. Angel vaguely wondered how that worked. They must have had little blowers in their mouths. After Ophelia received claps, whistles, and a standing ovation for blowing out two of her five candles, servers began cutting and passing out kick, while the animatronics continued performing. Angel slouched in her chair watching the animatronics dance. She wished she could re-choreograph their routine. As soon as the kick had been doled out, microphone feedback pierced through the commotion and the announcer called out. And now for the grand finale of today's festivities. May we have the birthday girl back on stage, please? Ophelia grinned and ran out to the stage. Everyone cheered again. Angel looked around the room until she spotted Dominic. He was talking to his boss at the edge of the dining room, but he saw her glancing his way. He winked at her. Angel smiled. Maybe things were looking up. It was, after all, only a month to graduation. And then she was going to stay with a friend in another state while they attended a summer-long acting workshop. Angel got a scholarship for it.
and she'd been saving up for travel and food expenses, which was all she needed since her friend was the one to change her rent. Then after that, performing art school. Pretty soon, she'd be living her own life, making her own choices, and she wouldn't have to take any more orders from Myron or play second fiddle to Ophelia. And now for the pierce of resistance! The announcer shouted, Lower away! The band played a loud fanfare, and something started coming down from the ceiling. Angel figured they were about to see a Freddy shaped pinata or something. Pinatas seem to be popular at kids' birthday parties these days. Only half watching the thing let lower down, Angel blinked and looked more carefully when she saw that the object wasn't a pinata. At least it wasn't a pinata that looked like any she'd seen before. Sinking slowly down into the room, a sort of soft-looking statue was undulating and quivering its way closer and closer to the stage. The statue was vaguely girl-shaped, and it wasn't made of paper mache It seemed to be made of... Was that candy? Angel leaned forward and squinted. Yeah, it looked like gummy candy. It was like a big gummy statue. Okay, that was different. Interested now, even as she was equally repelled, Angel watched the gummy statue throw out its arms, kick its legs, and gyrate its body. Clearly some form of animatronic like Freddy and his band members. The gummy statue was in constant motion. It flung itself this way and that. Weird. Gross. And maybe a little cool. Kids! The announcer called out. For your eating enjoyment, we present to you the birthday gummy! The kids cheered. The announcer looked at Ophelia. You, my lovely young lady, as the birthday girl, have the privilege of taking the first bite of our yummy gummy. You will start with the yummy gummy's toes, and you get the responsibility of having the last bite. The yummy gummy's gun drop nose. Ophelia laughed and clapped her hands. She started toward the gummy statue. The announcer held up a hand. Before you start, dear birthday girl, let me repeat to you all. Only the birthday girl can take the gumdrop nose. That is for Ophelia and only for Ophelia. Does everyone understand? The kids all chorused. Yes! Excellent! The announcer said. Now you may begin, Ophelia, and then, kids, come on up and join her. You will all need to take bites to devour this yummy gummy. Ready, set, go! Ophelia ran over to the gummy statue and bit off its big toe. Even though it was made of candy, watching Ophelia eat the toe made Angel feel a little sick. She thought it was strange that the gummy statue kept moving even as the other kids filled the stage and began chewing their way up the statue's legs. Angel would have thought they would have turned off the animatronics before the thing got eaten. But again, now that the gummy was being consumed by scrabbling children, Angel sat back and tapped her foot. For a few minutes, she watched the kids eat the candy, but then she started feeling queasy. The scene reminded her of the horrible nature shows Myron liked to watch, the one where the lions ran down a zebra and chowed down. Angel hated those shows. It's just nature, Angel, Myron would say to her, when she objected. Quit being so squeamish. Nature or not, she didn't like seeing living things eaten. She didn't even like seeing the lobsters in the tanks at restaurants. The gummy statue was just a little too lifelike to enjoy seeing it devoured by a horde of little kid mouths. So by the time the kids were halfway up the lakes, she'd reach into her purse and come up with a nail file. She started touching up her nails. Another several years passed, and the announcer shouted, You're doing great, kids! Remember, the gumdrop knows it's for Ophelia, and only Ophelia! Angel glanced up to see the kids were at the neck. Only the statue's head was left. It had been lowered closer to the stage so the kids could reach it. Angel watched a pudgy kid tear off the head's ear with his little white teeth. 
Her stomach flip-flopped. She looked back down at her nails. She didn't look up again until the announcer shouted, Everyone stop! The kids froze. The head was almost gone. Ophelia, our birthday girl, come and get your gumdrop nose. The announcer called. Angel looked up once more. She saw Ophelia sitting at the edge of the stage, looking like she might be sick. The announcer, unperturbed, danced over, pulled her to her feet, and escorted her to the remains of the gummy statue. Take your gumdrop nose, the announcer said. Ophelia looked at the announcer, then reached out and plucked the nose from the nearly consumed head. She tugged on the announcer's leg, and he bent over. She whispered something to him, and he stood. Our birthday girl is going to take her gumdrop nose home to a server at a later time. Let's give her a big round of applause. For what? Angel wondered. Saving a gumdrop for later? Please. Angel shook her head and waited for the century that had been Ophelia's birthday party to come to an end. They finally left Freddy's at around 6 o'clock p.m. Considering they'd left the house before noon, Angel decided it had to have been one of the longest birthday parties on record. The sun was still in the sky, reminding Angel how close they were to June and graduation, her ticket to freedom. The thought helped loosen some of her taut muscles. Angel got into the back seat of Myron's top-of-the-line minivan and strapped herself in while Myron helped Ophelia into her car seat. Ophelia said she was feeling bloopy because she ate too much of the gummy statue. She still hadn't eaten the gumdrop nose, though. It had been wrapped carefully in plastic for her. Ophelia stank of sweat and garlic. Angel shrunk against her door and turned to look out the window. She pressed her nose against the warm glass and tried to breathe the sun's expansive rays through the glass instead of Ophelia's stench. Myron finished strapping in his precious daughter and then got in the driver's seat. Angel's mom was already in the passenger seat, visor down, checking her makeup. Myron started the engine and then turned around to look at Ophelia. So, are you ready for your big birthday surprise, sweetie? Angel swiveled to gawk at Myron. He had to be kidding. There was more than that extravagant birthday display they just endured? Ophelia, who had been about to nod off before Myron spoke, lifted her head and clapped her hands. Birthday surprise? What is it, Daddy? You'll have to wait and see, my princess. Ophelia bounced in her car seat. She grinned at Angel and asked, Do you know what my surprise is? Angel shook her head and turned toward the window again. She did her best to zone out as the minivan began moving, and she must have done a good job because the next thing she knew, Myron was shouting, Here we are! Ophelia let out an adult-sized snort and opened her eyes. Angel blinked and wiped her wet eyes. Then she blinked again and wiped her eyes again. No. Really? Myron had pulled the minivan into a graveled area in front of a huge barn next to a grassy paddock in which three lovely chestnut horses grazed. The evening sun caressed their backs, turning them golden. Horses! Ophelia squealed. Oh, Daddy, are there ponies? I want a pony! I know, sweetie! Myron laughed. He got out of the minivan and opened the back door to unstrap his daughter. Come on, Angel, her mother said. Angel forced herself to open the minivan door. She had to command her feet to move. She did not want to see what was about to happen. She got out of the car and looked around. Myron, Ophelia, and Angel's mom were heading toward the barn, and they didn't seem to care she wasn't with them. So Angel turned in the opposite direction. She picked her way across the gravel, listening to her footsteps crunch as she approached the wood fence around the paddock. One of the horses, a mare, trotted over to see her, dropping a huge head over the top of the fence to nuzzle Angel's shoulder. 
The mare smelled like fresh hay and moist earth. She also smelled a little like manure. Or maybe that wasn't the horse. The paddock needed cleaning up. Angel laughed when the mare gave Angel an insistent shove with her nose. I don't have anything for you, she said. Do you want to give her an apple? Angel turned to see a red-headed girl coming her way. The girl's long hair was plaited into a braid, and she was smiling. She wore denim overalls, and she looked open and friendly. Hi, Angel said. Hi. The girl held out a slice of apple. Angel took it. Put it in your palm and hold your palm out flat and steady, the girl said. Angel did as she was instructed. The horse took the apple slice. Her lips felt warm and soft against Angel's palm. The puff of her breath tickled. Angel smiled. You're awesome, she told the horse. Thanks, the red-headed girl said. Angel looked at her. Oh, you weren't talking to me, the girl laughed. I get that all the time. Next to the horses, I tend to disappear. Sorry, Angel said. My name's Angel. Tammy. You work here? Angel asked. Tammy nodded. This is my dad's place. That's my mom and stepdad over there, Angel said. Ophelia is getting a pony. Ophelia? Angel pointed. My stepsister. Oh, yeah. Sweet little girl. She's been out here a couple times to ride the ponies. But today, she's hitting the jackpot. Angel ignored the sweet little girl comment. What do you mean by the jackpot? Oh, I mean, Ophelia isn't just getting a pony. She's getting a pony and a horse. Her dad wants her to have the pony while she's still small, but he's not yearling for her too. He wants her to grow up with a horse, and she's going to be getting private lessons all year long too. How much does that cost? Angel blurted. Sorry, that was rude, and you probably can't tell me. No, I get it. And I don't think there's any confidentiality in our business, at least not in this part of it. Now, if we're talking racehorses, that would be another coral fillies. Angel smiled. The pony's $2,000. The yearling is $2,000. But that's just the beginning. We'd charge a couple thousand a year to keep and take care of a pony or a horse. So your stepdad will be spending about $4,000 a year on fees. And then the lessons will be $50 a day. So, let's say she comes an average of three times a week, even. For 50 weeks, that's... what? Tammy looked upward, doing math in her head. That's 7,500 a year, Angel said. Yeah, Tammy said. So, what did you get for your birthday this year? Angel laughed. <laughs> Dinner at a burger place, because that's where I really wanted to go. I'm a vegetarian. Oh, that's rude. I know, right? But I also get a small kick and a new set of suitcases, you know, for when I leave home. Tammy barked out a laugh. Oh, sorry. That's so sad, it's funny. Tammy covered her mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. Angel laughed too. It's all right. They say comedy is tragedy plus time. Tammy shook her head. I was feeling sorry for myself before I came over here to talk to you. See, I want to go to culinary school, and my dad won't let me go until the fall because his foreman got injured, and I need to stay and help. I mean, once Ed, the foreman, is back, dad will pay for my school, and he's even getting me a car. Angel sighed. I'm not bragging, Tammy said. I'm only telling you so I can hear how good I actually have it. I really am sorry you're stuck with the jackass of a stepdad. Really sorry. Angel shrugged. Well, I'm glad I can hang here and make you happy. It was well after 8.30 p.m. when they finally got home. Ophelia was asleep again when Myron pulled the minivan into the garage. Angel was numb. She was only breathing, she thought, because it was habit. She was in shock, so angry, that she had no clue how to process it. She just couldn't believe what had happened. No, that wasn't true. She did believe it, and that's what made her so angry. So did you love your party and your surprise, my princess? Myron asked Ophelia as they came through the mudroom and laundry room 
from the full car garage. Angel ignored Myron and his daughter as she cut through the kitchen and headed up the stairs to her bedroom. Her mom and then Myron and Ophelia followed her. She listened to the echo of their footfalls as they tripped over the expensive hardwood floors that Myron was inordinately proud of. The house sounded so cavernous, so cold and uninviting. It was big, but who cared? Myron and Angel's mother had the biggest bedroom in the house, naturally. It was a huge master suite with a sitting area. Ophelia's room, though, wasn't much smaller. Her domain was also a suite, with a sleeping area, a reading nook, and a play area. She also had her own huge closet and bathroom. Angel got a normal-sized room at the end of the hall, and she didn't get her own bathroom. She had to walk to the other end of the hall to use a bathroom. Whatever. She'd be gone soon enough. Angel went into a plain peach and white room. Myron had had it decorated without Angel's input. She hated the colors, she hated the sheer curtains, and she hated the twin-size bed. She was almost an adult. She deserved at least a full-size bed. The only thing Angel liked about her room was the view. Her window looked out over the backyard, which was huge and filled with trees. Flopping down on her tiny bed, Angel clenched her teeth and thought about the unfairness of it all. What was she? Trash? Something to be ignored and discarded? Angel stood and started pacing back and forth. One day, one day very soon, Myron, her mother, and Ophelia, too, would realize how wrong they were to dismiss her. Angel was not going to be ignored. She was going to be successful, hugely successful. And when she was, she wasn't going to share dime with her horrible mother and stepdad and stepsister. She was going to make it. She was going to be the center of attention. Angel dropped onto her bed again. She thought about just going to sleep. The day had totally drained her, but her stomach wouldn't stop growling. So she left her room and headed for the kitchen. As she went back down the hall, Angel glanced, more from a habit than from interest, into Ophelia's room. Ophelia was nowhere in sight. She was probably in the master with her daddy. Angel saw the plastic-wrapped gumdrop note sitting on Ophelia's white-painted nightstand. She noticed Ophelia had placed the nose in her treasure's dish, a little crystal, yes, real crystal, shallow bowl that held everything from rocks and seashells to coins and gold jewelry. Angel shook her head and continued on. Back downstairs, Angel went into the kitchen and flipped on the light switch. Warm yellow glowing circles shined down from the amber glass pendants above the tanker sized island and illuminated black granite countertops. Recessed lights lit up custom cherry cabinets and stainless steel appliances. The kitchen was a gourmet cook's dream. Too bad a gourmet cook didn't live here. Angel cooked a little, but not a ton. She'd had to learn what little she knew how to cook on her own. Come to think of it, She'd had to learn everything she knew how to do on her own. She went to the fridge, scrounged around, and found a bean salad she made for herself a couple days before. She was about to take the first bite when the phone rang. Thinking of Dominic, she snatched up the receiver. Hello? Ah, I think I hear the voice of an angel, Dominic said. Angel thought she sounded casual and relaxed, but her pulse had at least doubled its pace the second Dominic spoke. I am very funny, aren't I? Aren't you lucky to have met me? Angel laughed, I'm <laughs> beside myself. There are two of you? Lucky me. Angel groaned but giggled. You do think you're funny, don't you? Hilarious. Angel shook her head. And also very modest. Very. Not to mention subsistent. Angel said, smiling. Dominic chuckled. Brevity is a soul of wit. Good one, Angel said. Proud of yourself? Inordinately. Angel laughed. She had to admit she was impressed that he'd thrown out another Hamlet quote. But she wasn't going to tell him that. You're too much. The lady doth protest too much, methinks, Dominic said. Angel groaned. A click came over the line, and Myron's heavy breathing breathed Angel's ear. 
I'm on the phone, Myron, she said. It's late. Who are you talking to? Late? It isn't even 9 o'clock p.m. Angel was going to lie and say it was one of her friends. But Dominic, clueless about the extent of Myron's unreasonableness, spoke up. My name is Dominic, sir. I'm calling to ask out her stepdaughter. Who the hell are you? Myron asked. I have never heard her talk about a Dominic. I just... Angel tried to insert. We just met today, sir. Dominic said innocently. Angel groaned. Where? Are you lying? She was with us. When do you get up by lying to me, young man? Dominic spoke, after a slight hesitation. He seemed to be getting that Myron wasn't playing with the full deck. I know she was with you today, sir, Dominic said in the slow, soothing tone one used to pacify a distressed toddler. She was at Freddy's with your family. I work part-time there. I'm one of the assistant managers. I didn't see you, Myron snapped. Another little silence preceded Dominic's patient response. With all due respect, sir, you wouldn't know if you did see me. We haven't met yet. That's exactly my point. You're not taking Angel out. We don't know you. I'm happy to come over and... Dominic began. You're not coming to this house. We don't know you. Myron repeated. I'm sorry, but how will you get to know me if you don't meet me? Get the hell off my phone, smart aleck, Myron said. He slammed down his receiver and bellowed down the stairs. You better be off in ten seconds, Angel, or I'm coming down there. Angel cringed. I have to go, she said to Dominic. Call me when you can, Dominic said. Angel hung up the phone, just as Myron stomped into the kitchen. Why do you get up handing out my phone number to a total stranger? He demanded. It's my phone number, too, Angel pointed out. Just by happiness, Myron said. What's that supposed to mean? It means I married your mother and you came along for the ride. I came along for the ride? Angel threw back, incredulous. She widened her eyes and said at Myron. Her mom came into the room. She held up a small stack of envelopes. I got the mail. Angel, you got a letter. Angel took the letter her mother held out, and she glanced at the return address. It was from the student loan office. Maybe they were going to give her more money. She ripped the envelope open and looked at the letter. She read a couple sentences. What? She blurted. What is it? Her mother said. Angel looked up at her mother. They're rescinding my student loan offer because they updated their records and discovered you're now married to Myron, and Myron makes too much money for me to qualify for a loan. Well, he does make a lot of money, her mother said. But how does that help me? Angel shouted. She rolled to face Myron. Are you going to pay for me to go to school? Not that stupid art school. But that's the school I want to go to. It's a good school. A nationally ranked school. I don't care. It's not a normal college. I'm not paying for something that isn't a normal college. Shouldn't have to pay for anything at all, come to that. But as a gift to my beloved Bianca, I'd pay for you to go to a state college. That's the deal. Take it or leave it. But you can afford it, Angel argued. You wouldn't even notice the money missing. The amount of money I need to go to school is nothing to you. You have a lot to learn about money, young lady, Myron said. Angel couldn't keep it inside anymore. She hadn't said a word at the house farm. She hadn't made a peep in the car, but it came out now. You just bought your daughter two horses! Angel screamed. She's five! You're going to spend more on those horses and on her horseback riding lessons in the next few years than you would have all my education plus a car. How is horseback riding better than a performing arts school? At least I'm going to school to learn a skill I can use to make a living. What good will riding horses do for Ophelia? She's going to be way too big to be a jockey. Don't you insult your sister! Myron shouted. She's not my sister! Andrew yelled for the second time today. She's your daughter and she's a thief! What the hell does that mean? Myron demanded. She stole what should have been mine! She stole my mother and she's stealing my future! It isn't fair! Life isn't fair, Myron said, smirking. You're ruining my life, Angel yelled. She turned to her mother. If you hadn't married this us, we'd be poor. Yeah, 
But at least we'd both be happy. At least I'd be able to get a student loan. I'm very happy, her mother said, woodenly. Yeah, and I'm a piñata, Angel said. She picked up the open plastic container of bean salad, and she threw it in the sink. The container bounced up on impact, and beans flew everywhere. Angel ran out of the kitchen. You get back here and clean that up, Myron yelled. Clean it up yourself, Angel yelled back. It's your freaking house. Angel took the stairs two at a time. She reached the hall and stomped down it, intending to go into her room, throw herself onto the bed, and cry her eyes out. But as she passed Ophelia's room, her peripheral gaze landed on the plastic wrapper with the gumdrop nose. Angel stopped. She looked at the nose, and she saw Ophelia wearing a new pair of horse motif pajamas, sitting in her play area, happily talking to her baby dolls, which were riding on plush horses. Angel couldn't help herself. If she was going to have a treasure taken from her, the treasure of going after her dream, of being able to live her life the way she wanted to live it, Ophelia had to lose the treasure too. Fair was fair. Angel charged into Ophelia's room. Wanna play horsey rides? Ophelia asked. Angel ignored her. She strode to Ophelia's nightstand and snatched up the wrapped gumdrop nose. Hey! Ophelia said. That's mine! Ophelia started to scramble to her feet, but she tripped over her big plush horse head slippers. She landed on her hands and knees and started crying. Yeah? Well, it's mine now! Angel unwrapped the nose and popped it into her mouth. No! Angel screamed. She thrashed out of her slippers, stood, and ran toward Angel. Stop! She yelled. It was too late. Mmm, good, Angel said, chewing dramatically. Actually, it wasn't good at all. It tasted horrible. Like sugar, and she didn't know what. It was just a sugary yuck. But she chewed and swallowed it anyway. Ophelia squawked like a bird, and then began howling like a deranged wolf. Angel could hear her mother and Myron thundering up the stairs. She shot an imaginary gun at Ophelia and said, Catch you later, kid. Then she darted to her room, just as Myron got to the top of the stairs. Ophelia continued to howl, and Angel didn't care at all. She went into her room and shut and locked the door. For good measure, because she could hear Myron's raised voice and heavy steps in the hall, she put her desk chair under the knob. She worked her tongue around inside her mouth, trying to get rid of the disgusting taste of the gumdrop nose. But even as she did, she felt a nauseating sense of self-satisfaction. It felt distressingly good to make Ophelia feel bad. For once, Angel was able to take something from Ophelia instead of the other way around. It made her feel small and ashamed that she was so triumphant. See? There! Ophelia had just stolen something else. Angel's self-respect. Myron pounded on her door and shouted something unintelligible. She tensed. Myron had never hit her or anything. He'd only used his words to berate her. But she didn't know what Myron would do to her for eating Ophelia's precious nose. She giggled. That sounded funny. The roaring outside her door wasn't funny, though. She stopped giggling. She backed up and sat on her bed. Not for the first time, she wished she had a phone in her room. She wanted to call Dominic, or her friends, or the police. Someone had to be on her side. Get out here, young lady! Myron yelled outside her door. You've gone too far this time! She didn't respond to him. She just sat on her bed, hugged her knees to her chest, and rocked herself. When Myron kept shouting and pounding on her door, she turned off her lights and put on her headphones. She closed her eyes and began singing along with her favorite song. Singing would make her feel better. Angel woke up abruptly. Where was she? She rubbed her eyes and tried to orient herself. The last she remembered, she was listening to music and singing. She looked around the room. It was dark. She flipped on the lamp on her nightstand and looked at a clock. It was just past 11 o'clock p.m. She took off her headphones and listened. The house was silent except for the intermittent ticks and groans, the usual sounds. 
Angel's neck itched. She scratched at it. Her jaw itched, and she scratched at that as well. When the itching started up on her chest, she got up and went to her dresser so she could look in the mirror. Had she gotten bitten by some insect at the horse farm? Angel looked at her reflection. She sucked in her breath. Even in the soft light from her nightstand, Angel could see the skin of her jaw, neck, and upper chest were mottled bright red and unnaturally pale white. The skin was all puffy and angry looking. It looked like a rash, but not like a rash she'd ever seen before. Angel touched her inflamed skin. It felt weird, like it had a squishy texture. She stared at herself in horror. Oh, this was not so good. Not good at all. Angel didn't like to think of herself as super wrapped up in how she looked, because that was something she hated about her mother. But she had to admit, she tended to take her looks for granted. She was pretty and she knew it. She didn't use her looks to gain an unfair advantage or anything. She didn't let her looks turn her into an idiot either. Boys at school asked her out all the time, but she usually said no. She'd only dated a couple guys, and she found them to be immature and grabby. She never let anyone progress past a few dates. She never had a boyfriend either. Dominic was the first boy she'd considered to be boyfriend material. But Angel's looks were an integral part of her plan to be a successful actress, singer, and dancer. She was going into an industry that valued looks almost even above talent. Getting some kind of weird skin condition a month before an acting workshop was the exact opposite of what she needed. She stared at the blotchy mass of bright red nodules on her skin. And as she watched, the redness spread. It was spreading fast. She could actually see it creeping up from her jawline to the lower part of her cheek. Maybe it was some sort of rash from the horses at the stable. She had been feeling a little congestion at the barn. Ophelia and her horrible father had taken everything from her. It only made sense that they'd be responsible for taking her health too. Oh, stop. Please stop. Angel pleaded as she watched the ugliness fan outward from her jaw and creep up her lovely smooth cheeks. What could she do? Angel went to her door, listened, heard nothing, and carefully opened the door. As soon as the door was open, she could hear Myron's reverberant snorts coming through the double doors to the master suite. The louder blasts nearly vibrated the whole house. How did her mother sleep next to that man? With earplugs, that was how. Her mom bought the best earplugs money could buy. Ophelia was snoring too. Her snores were like mini versions of her dad's. Angel tiptoed down the hall, went into the bathroom, shut the door as quietly as she could, and then turned on the bathroom light. Ugly gold wall sconces, way too formal for a suburban house, flanked an equally ornate, framed mirror. She again faced her reflection. She almost screamed, but clapped a hand over her mouth and whimpered instead. In just a few minutes, it had taken her to get from her room to the bathroom. The rash had spread farther up her cheeks and down her chest. Angel turned on the water and grabbed for soap. Maybe if it was a rash, if she cleaned the rest of the dust and dander from her skin, it would stop any further advancement. She started to soap up a washcloth, then she looked at her hair. Dominic had cleaned her hair, and her skin for that matter. What had been in that plastic bottle? It had been more than water. It had a floral smell. What if the solution in that bottle was toxic? It was from Freddy's. It wouldn't have surprised Angel at all if something was wrong with it. She needed to take a shower. Turning off the faucet, Angel turned around to turn on the shower, and she stripped out of her clothes. She hoped everyone was sleeping deeply enough not to hear the shower. She was pretty sure they were. Even if they weren't, it didn't matter. She had to get off whatever crud she picked up at Freddy's. Angel got in the marble shower and let hot water sluice over her. 
She reached for the shampoo and poured more over her head than she'd ever used in her life. She proceeded to scrub herself harder than she ever had. She scrubbed so hard it hurt. And she scrubbed so hard her skin bled. When she saw a trickle of red going down the drain, she realized she'd gone too far. She rinsed thoroughly and toweled off. She wrapped herself in another dry towel. Before she faced the mirror again, Angel took a deep breath. Please, she begged, please be better. Closing her eyes, she moved over to the mirror. She faced it, and she opened her eyes. She immediately started breathing hard, almost hyperventilating. Her heart pounded out a panic rhythm of what felt like 300 beats per minute. Angel's legs went out from under her, and she sank down onto the fluffy white bath mat. She started to cry as her mind replayed the hideousness she'd just seen in the mirror. The rash was on both cheeks now, and it was moving upward. It had reached the bottom of her cheekbones already. The rash was moving down too. It covered most of her chest, and it had spread to her shoulders. It must have gotten so fully into her system that washing did no good. What could she do now? Angel started to put her head into her hands, but she stopped herself. What if it got on her hands too? Angel looked wildly around the room as if some solution to a problem was going to present itself. None did. What do I do? She asked. She didn't know whom she was asking, but for some reason she got an answer. Angel snapped her fingers and crawled over to the vanity cabinet under the sink. She threw the doors open and began pawing through the first aid and other supplies stored there. She thought, yes, there it was. A few months ago, Ophelia got poison ivy and Angel's mom bought calamine lotion. Maybe that would help. Angel flung aside bottles and boxes in the cabinet until she could reach the bottle of pinkish liquid. She grabbed it, opened it, and began slathering herself with calamine. When she was done, she sat on the floor and tried to calm her breathing. In through the nose, one, two, three. Out through the mouth, one, two, three. She did this ten times and told herself everything was okay. The itching wasn't as bad, she didn't think. That was good, right? Angel sat and breathed some more. She could feel her heart rate slowing. It's going to be okay, she told herself. Everything is fine. You just have a little rash from the stuff in that bottle. Not that different, really, from getting a poison ivy rash. Ophelia had survived that just fine. Angel would be fine too. Angel realized she was getting cold. She reached into the cabinet for a third towel. That's when she saw that the rash could now be seen on her upper arms, well below the edge of the now crusty colorine lotion. No! Angel gasped. She jumped up, her heart hammering again. She looked in the mirror. Her mouth dropped open. Not only was the rash spreading well beyond where she put the calamine lotion, but the rash looked different now, too. Was the calamine making it worse? Angel got back in the shower and rinsed off all the lotion. Getting out again and wrapping herself in a new towel, she forced herself to return to the mirror. A shriek of terror caught in her throat. She started to shiver uncontrollably. She was turning into a lizard, a slimy, squishy-looking lizard. From beneath her eyes, down her entire face and neck and chest, and now moving lower on her arms, gelatinous-looking scales were forming on her skin. The scales were red and gray and pink, and they looked moist and spongy, even though she just dried herself off. Angel was horrified, but also unable to look away from the horror unfolding in her mirror. What was it? She examined her arm, and she carefully touched one of the gooey scales. It felt springy, like a rubbery pillow, kind of vicious to the touch. It felt kind of like a wet gumdrop. Angel sucked in air. Could this have something to do with that stupid gumdrop nose? She closed her eyes and ground her teeth together. This was all Ophelia's fault. If she hadn't had a stupid party and gotten that stupid nose... Angel could have had an allergic reaction to the nose. What was in it? Wait, 
allergic reaction. Whether it was the gumdrop nose or not that caused it, Angel could have been having an allergic reaction, but it was easy enough to fix, right? Angel turned and crossed the bathroom to the wall cabinet next to the door. That was where her mother kept over-the-counter medicines that she didn't want Ophelia getting into. Surely that had some antihistamines. Angel opened the cabinet door and sorted frantically through the boxes, bottles, and vials. Yes, Angel spotted a box of antihistamines, and she didn't even bother to read the dosage instructions. She took three of them. Then she sat on the toilet seat and waited. She didn't even know how long to wait. How long did it take for these things to start working? She sang softly while she waited. She sang three full songs. Her eyelids started to feel heavy. Didn't antihistamines make you feel drowsy? If so, that meant the pills were working. Excited, Angel stood to look in the mirror again. She again had to cover her mouth so she wouldn't scream. Her eyelids went heavy because she was drowsy. Her eyelids were heavy because they were now covered with the sticky scales. So was most of her forehead and the rest of her arms. Making sure her towel was securely tucked under her, Angel grabbed her discarded clothes, stopped off the bathroom light, threw open the bathroom door, and ran down the hall toward her room as quietly as she could. She couldn't handle this on her own. She needed to get to a hospital. She had to get dressed, and she didn't want to put on the clothes she just took off. They could be infected. She probably shouldn't even have been carrying them. But it was too late now. As she passed her mom and Myron's room, she hesitated. She wondered if she should wake them. No! No way! What was wrong with her? Were the goopy scales spreading to her brain too? If she'd had normal parents, loving parents, of course, she'd go to them for help. But she had a useless mother, and she had Myron. She had the two people most responsible for everything wrong in her life. They were the jerks who wouldn't help her with her college because they were too busy spoiling her brother of a subsister. No way was she going to ask them for help. In effect, she had no family. She was alone. Angel slipped into her room and leaned back against the door. Should she call one of her friends? She didn't have what she'd call a BFF, but she hung out with a lot of kids in the drama department. One of them might help her. As soon as she had the idea, she dismissed it. She didn't want those people to see her like this. They might help, but they'd also see her situation as an opportunity. Looking like this, she wasn't going to be able to perform the final spring performances. No, her friends would be more likely to gloat over her predicament than help her with it. And what about her teachers? No, same thing. They were supportive, but their support had a lot to do with her looks. She couldn't let them see her like this. She saw herself in the ER all by herself. All by herself, but surrounded by dozens of strangers. ERs were busy places. Did she really want to be seen like this in a crowded place? Absolutely not! No, the ER wasn't the place for her. She shouldn't go to the hospital. If something from Freddy's was causing this, there was only one thing to do. Dropping a pile of clothes, Angel carefully poked in the pockets until she found Dominic's card. Here she'd thought he was a great guy. She should have known better. Why did she think someone who worked at that nasty pizzeria could be a good guy? Dominic wasn't good. He worked for the awful place that made her sick. Well, now he was going to have to help her. She'd make him help her. And he was going to get a piece of her mind, too. What kind of crud was in Freddy's anyway? Were the food and the candy poisoned? Was the water full of toxins? Germs? Did she pick up a virus there? Angel ran to the hallway side table and grabbed the phone. Please be there, she breathed as she dialed Freddy's number. He did say he could always call her, but she also wasn't sure what time the arcade closed. It was really late. Dominic answered on the third ring. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, he began. What did you do to me? Angel snapped before he could finish. Angel, is that you? Yes, it's me. Or at least it is for now. 
but I don't know how much longer I'm going to be me. I'm sorry? Can you slow down? I think I might be missing something. You're not making sense. What do you have in that horrible place? She wanted to shout, but she didn't want anyone to wake up. So she asked a question in quiet, clipped tones. Can we back up? I feel like I got on a train in the middle of its run. I don't know where it started, and I don't know where it's going. Stop trying to be clever! I'm not being clever. In fact, I think I'm being pretty dense. I really don't know what you're talking about. Can you please start at the beginning? I should have known you weren't any different than other guys. Sure, you seemed different, but you were just playing games, weren't you? What did you do to me? Dominic sighed. Angel, please tell me what's going on. I'm turning into a slimy, squishy, disgusting lizard is what's going on. I have these putrid scales spreading all over me. Angel thought she had Dominic grown, but she didn't stop talking. That's what's going on. And it has to have something to do with being at Freddy's today. It could have been whatever you had in that plastic bottle, maybe. Or something in the food or candy. Or, you tell me, something in Freddy's did this. Dominic was silent. He was still on the line. Angel could hear him breathing. Dominic? Dominic still didn't speak. Are you there? Angel asked. Another few seconds passed. I'm so sorry, Angel, he finally said. So you know what's wrong with me? You need to come to Freddy's, he said. You didn't answer me. Come to Freddy's and they'll explain. His voice, already so smooth and deep, dropped even lower. It soothed her. She could feel her heart rate slow just a little. And I'll help you, Angel. Just get to Freddy's. Angel's fury at Dominic and the stupid pizzeria abated enough for her to feel a spark of hope. You'll help me? Her voice sounded small, but she didn't care. Yes, I'll help you. Just come here to Freddy's. Okay. And Angel? Yeah? Hurry. Okay. Bye. Angel hesitated for just an instant, then said, Bye. Angel sat on the floor for several seconds, clutching the phone and listening to the dead air of the ended call. Dominic would help her. And maybe he hadn't betrayed her after all. Maybe everything would be okay. Angel suddenly realized how much time she was wasting. She dropped the phone, jumped up, and ran back to her room. Angel yanked open Baru drawers and pulled out fresh underwear, a bra, jeans, and a t-shirt. She threw on her clothes as fast as she could, and she thrust her feet into her sandals. Okay, that was the easy part. Now she had to get to Freddy's. She couldn't walk. It was too far. Not to mention, she didn't want to be seen. She looked at the digital clock on a nightstand. It was 11.35pm. Dark. But it wasn't late enough for the streets to be totally deserted. She thought about biking, but even that would take her a long time. No. The dreadful jelly scales were spreading too fast. She needed to drive. She'd take her mother's sports car. She'd driven the car plenty of times. Sometimes, when Myron wasn't around, her mom would tell Angel she wanted to go on a drive, and she felt like being chauffeured. Angel loved driving the zippy car. She wished it were hers. So driving the car wasn't an issue, but getting it away from the house might be. Could she deactivate the alarm, get into the garage, open the garage door, start the car, and leave without anyone waking up? She had to. She had to get this handled, or her life was going to be totally ruined. Angel grabbed one of the scarves and wrapped it around her head so it would obscure her face as much as possible. She tucked her hair behind her ears. Suddenly, Angel thought of the way Dominic had tucked her hair behind her ear. Her eyes filled with tears. It figured. Story of her life. I meet an amazing guy, and I start turning into a clammy reptile she thought. Would Dominic still like her when he saw the way she looked now? Was he as one-dimensional as all the other guys she'd met? The ones whose interest only went skin deep? If he was, that was the end of it. Even if he wasn't, how could they go out with her looking like this? How long would it take for this to go away? Would it be gone by graduation? 
by the time she left for the summer workshop. Why couldn't things go Angel's way for a change? It really wasn't fair. By the time Angel got into her mother's bright yellow sports car, the squidgy reptile skin had completely covered Angel's arms. She assumed it was heading down her legs too, because they felt funny. Her stomach felt strange as well, kind of heavy. She noticed that when she sat down in the driver's seat of the car. She was shorter in the seat than she ever had been before. She had to adjust the rear view mirror downward, and she usually had to adjust it upward because she was a little taller than her mom. When she noticed this, she lifted her shirt to see what was happening. She let out a little scream. Her stomach had gotten so elastic that it was kind of collapsing in on itself when she sat down. Was she going to be able to get to Freddy's before she was too pliable to do anything at all? Angel backed down her driveway and pressed the button to close the garage door. Her neighborhood was an expanse of darkness broken up by outdoor porch lights. In the distance, a dog barked, but otherwise, the only sound was the car's engines. None of the houses near hers had lights in the windows. It didn't look like anyone was staying up late to see Angel taking her mother's car out for a spin. Good. Angel pointed the car in the direction of Freddy's, and she resisted the urge to stomp on the accelerator. Speeding through town wasn't the thing to do right now. So she drove, well, like an angel, careful to obey every traffic law so as not to draw any attention to herself. Being in the highly visible, expensive car made being unobtrusive a little challenging, even under normal circumstances, and these weren't normal circumstances. Most of the trip was quiet and uneventful, but a block from Freddy's, she had a scare. Waiting at a red light, she heard the grumble of some kind of muscle car come up next to the sports car. She didn't look over, but the driver of the car whistled and called out. Want to have some fun, honey? Angel clutched the steering wheel harder. Or she tried to. When she couldn't get the grip she wanted, she looked down to see why. Oh no! Her fingers were turning into segmented chunks of mucus-like material that tanned her stomach. They didn't even look human anymore. The driver in the car next to her called out again. And she glanced at the driver's door to be sure the locks were engaged. She also lowered her hands to the bottom of the steering wheel so the driver couldn't see them in the relentless intrusion of the streetlights. The guy in the muscle car kept up a rude suggestive patter while the light stayed red. What was taking so long for it to change? Eventually, it turned green. The muscle car sped off. Angel let out pent-up breath. She drove the rest of the way to Freddy's without encountering another vehicle. When Angel finally pulled her mom's little sports car into the parking spot closest to the front door of Freddy's, she looked around at the brightly lit lot. Thankfully, no other cars were in it. She was alone. Now, scanning the area again, she opened the driver's door and headed toward Freddy's entrance. Before she got there, Dominic opened the door and looked out at her. Angel's steps faltered. Even though she needed Dominic's help, she still didn't want him to see her this way. She looked down and let her hair fall forward over her face. Angel? Dominic called out. It's okay. Don't worry about how you look. I don't care about that. I just need you to hurry so I can help you. Angel glanced at Dominic through the veil of her hair. His expression was somber, his lips were pressed together, and his eyes looked red. Had he been crying? He really seemed to care. This made Angel trust him even more. She walked forward and put her malformed hand in a strong, perfect one. Without a comment about her hand or any of the rest of her, he led her into Freddy's. Come on, I'll take you to the back. Angel let Dominic pull her down the hall. She looked up. The place looked much different now than it had a few hours ago. Not just because it was empty and quiet, but because... Because why? Angel frowned. Was it the lighting? During the party, every light in the restaurant had been on. 
Now, most of them were out, and the ones that were on were turned down to a dim setting. Every bright color in the place was muted. Shadows stretched down the hall ahead of her, and created pockets of darkness along the walls and the ceiling. The effect was sobering, maybe even a little scary. Taking a few tentative steps down the hall with Dominic, Angel could still see the pictures of the characters on the walls, but they looked less friendly now. Why was that? Was it the shadows? Or something else? Angel took a few more steps until she heard a weird clinking sound. Suddenly scared for no good reason, she stopped. It's okay, Dominic said. It's just one of the animatronics doing daily maintenance. Angel nodded and began hobbling forward again. She was feeling woozy. The edges of her vision started to get fuzzy, and her balance wavered. Was the restaurant getting darker? No, it was the same. The problem was her. She was starting to lose consciousness. Dominic, I'm having trouble seeing. Dominic put his arm around her and started moving her more quickly along the hall. He said something to her, but she didn't understand it. Something was wrong with her hearing now, too. It felt like she had cotton in her ears. And she was sinking toward the floor. Her legs were going limp. They wouldn't hold her up anymore. Dominic, help me! Dominic lifted her into his arms, and he began trotting down the hall. Suddenly, the lights were brighter. Not by a lot, but a little. They didn't seem to reveal any of the surroundings, though. Angel's diminished vision was worsening even more. The walls and floors going past her were taking on an amorphous quality. They were losing their edges and becoming indistinct, almost impressionistic. Angel tried to blink and bring her hand up to wipe her eyes, but her arms just swung loose at her sides. She couldn't get them to respond to her brain's commands. But really, what were her brain's commands? Her brain was meandering around as if her brain cells had turned into soft rubber. No, not rubber. She sensed they were turning into goo, like that goopy clay stuff Ophelia liked to play with, smooshing it between her little fingers like melting cheese oozing out of a grilled cheese sandwich. Okay, Angel, we're here. I'm going to put you in something that's going to help you. Do you understand? Angel nodded because she could suddenly hear again. Why? Maybe it was the relief. She was getting the help she needed. Dominic knew what was going on. He said he'd explain it. He hadn't explained, and she wanted him to. But mostly, she just wanted him to make it stop. Maybe Dominic has an antelope. No, that isn't right. Antidote. That's what it is. She tried to talk again, but she couldn't. She could see again, though. Like her hearing, her eyesight had miraculously cleared up. She blinked, and she could clearly see that Dominic was getting ready to lower her into a box. It was such a pretty box, a shiny wood box. Its grain so swirly and lovely that Angel wanted to become part of the box. She wanted the box to embrace her, hold her, and keep her safe. As soon as she saw the box, Angel no longer cared about what was happening to her. She didn't care about what was happening either. She didn't need an explanation. She was where she was supposed to be. Dominic bent over and began to put Angel in the box, and she tried to speak again. She wanted to say thank you. All she could get out was th you. I know. I know, Dominic said. It's going to be okay. His voice sounded odd, broken, like he was crying. Angel felt moisture on her forehead when Dominic leaned over her. Tears. She wanted to tell him it was okay. She was in the box now. It was her box. It belonged to her, and she belonged to it. Angel felt something prying at her eyes and her mouth. She felt hands prodding the skin on her arms. It's okay, Angel, Dominic repeated. It will be just a few hours at most. A few hours until what? Angel hoped it was a few hours until she was all well. Wouldn't that be great? She had something she wanted to do. What was it? I'm here, Angel, Dominic said. You're not alone. Dominic! That was what she wanted to do. She wanted to go out with Dominic. If she was better in a few hours, 
she'd be able to go. Where were they going to go? Do you feel anything? Dominic asked. Angel wanted to answer that question. Yes, she felt things. She felt a hard surface beneath her body. She felt something cool under her head. She felt the warmth of the bright light shining down on her. She felt hands on her forehead. Close your eyes, Angel, Dominic said. Angel did what he told her to do. The light went away. The world went dark. She could still hear, but sounds were distorted, like she was floating in water, her ears just below the surface. There you go, Dominic said. It'll be over soon. Good, Angel thought. And she let unconsciousness take her. Angel woke up abruptly, as if someone poked her or shouted at her. She was fully alert. That was good, wasn't it? She had a vague memory of being really out of it before she went to sleep. The rash had done something to her thinking. The rash! Did she still have it? Angel tried to sit up. She couldn't. She couldn't move at all. What was going on? She tried again. It felt like she was paralyzed. Not liking that feeling at all, Angel writhed and hit her forehead on something hard. She squirmed some more, and her elbows and knees whacked something hard. Not paralyzed. Confined. In what? For several moments, Angel fought to get free of the box she was in. She lamented Ophelia's party, what she understood vaguely was responsible for where she was now. But then she stopped struggling. Angel told herself to stay calm, stay stuck, then figure out what to do next. She scanned her body. It felt foreign, not familiar at all. But she could sense that she seemed to be in an upright position. She was standing. If she was, she was standing in some kind of a box that was so tightly fit around her that she had no leeway to move. Angel's breathing quickened. She didn't like confined spaces. She opened her mouth to call out, but her mouth was covered with something. Tape? She couldn't get her lips apart. She couldn't feel her teeth either, and she was having a little trouble breathing. Her nose felt funny, like it was partially plugged with something. Angel was on the verge of panic when, suddenly, she felt space open up beneath her feet. Then she felt the sensation of being lowered. Down, down, down. From what seemed like a great distance, she could hear the sound of children screaming. She recoiled. She hated the sound of children screaming. That sound always reminded her of her bothersome stepsister, Ophelia. Over the sound of the screaming, Angel heard a musical fanfare and a booming announcer's voice. She couldn't make out all his words, but it sounded like he was talking about someone's birthday. And she heard, Grand Finale! Why did those words seem familiar? The children's screams turned into cheers and laughter, and Angel's eyes were suddenly assaulted by bright, bright lights and lots of dazzling colors. She tried to figure out where she was because she had the sense she'd been here before, recently. But all she could see was light and color. The sensation of being lowered stopped, and now Angel could feel that she was hanging in mid-air. She felt her body swaying back and forth, back and forth. It was not a pleasant sensation, so she tried to control the motion by twisting herself this way and that. She also flailed her arms, and she was pleasantly surprised that she could. She was hanging, but at least she was no longer confined. She kicked out her legs, and she flexed her hands and feet. The announcer was saying something else. Angel caught the word yummy, but she couldn't work out the rest of what was being said. The children's clamor was getting louder, though. It felt like they were getting closer, too. Angel felt like she was being surrounded. She moved her body around some more, doing a sort of mid-air dance. She wondered if she could do a somersault. She tried. No. Something was attached to the top of her head. The announcer spoke again. His words were all run together, all mushy, until he got to his last three words. 
angel had those clearly. Ready, set, go! Julie smiled up at the announcer when he said, Ready, set, go! She took a step toward the gummy girl, oscillating from the ceiling. She so liked being the center of attention that she wanted to stretch out the moment. She turned to look out at her parents. They beamed at her. She waved at them. Happy birthday, Julie! Her mom called out. Yay! Birthday girl! Her dad shouted. Julie grinned, and she leaned over to the gummy girl dangling in front of her. She reached up a hand, grabbed the foot, and bit off the gummy's big toe. Everyone, join in! The announcer sang out. The other kids crowded around Julie, and they began eating up the swaying, squirming gummy candy that was unlike any other. And that is the end of story one. Thank you for listening to this read-through of Five Nights at Freddy's Fazbear Frights number 8. Story 1, Gumdrop Angel. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did, please hit that like button. And if you're new to this channel, why not subscribe to get the next story of this novel. Also, make sure you click that bell icon so you'll be notified the next time I post a story. And I'll be back next time with the next story.